today, we're going to go through some broad overviews of the current tax regime in the United States as relates to both income and transfer taxes for trust, how they work, how they operate, and also techniques to utilize tax reduction. So as a broad overview in the United States, at the federal level, we have two types of taxes for trust. You have the income and you transfer. Income taxes are under subtitle A of the code, Internal Revenue Code of 1986 as amended. Subtitle B are U.S. transfer taxes. These include the estate, gift, and generation skipping transfer tax. First off, as relates to U.S. transfer taxes, the most common thing that individuals already know about is the lifetime exemption amount. In the United States, we have a unified transfer tax you credit. That means that regardless of when you make a transfer, in life it would be a gift, or at death, either through probate or through a trust distribution, the transfer tax, the amount of credit that you receive and the tax rate are the same. We will talk later about some advantages of doing it during lifetime and others at death. But it's important to note that currently this exemption amount is indexed to inflation. So each year it's been going up. In 2020, the current amount is $11.58 million per individual. In 2019, it was $11.4 million. So please keep that in mind. The current tax rate, regardless if it's for a state or it's for gift taxes, is 40%. That's been the rate now for a while. It could change if Congress uh, changes the law, but that's how it'll stay. In, you know, until it updates. Please be aware that in under current law in 2026, these index inflation amounts, which are actually twice the size of what they have been normally, will jump back down to $5 million in 2026. It will be indexed at that time. We estimated it probably around $6 million, but again, any changes in the law would update that. One other thing you need to be aware of is the GST tax. This is a very unique tax that was implemented in 1984. The super wealthy were making gifts to their grandkids and even further down the line. And the rich were upset with that because they were being hit with the estate tax at every level. They didn't have the ability to give longer gifts out. So to remedy this, Congress passed the GST tax. Basically, if you make a gift to an individual that is two generations below you or 37 and a half years, we treat it as if it's going through the estate tax again. That's how it operates. So your credit amount is the same for the GST tax as it is for estate and gift, but you can't take advantage and do arbitrage. So you need to be aware of that. There are three types of events that cause the GST tax to take place one of which is a direct skip. That is when you make a, a direct gift or transfer to an individual who is a skip person. A skip person is anyone that is two generations or more below you or 37 and a half years. A taxable distribution, sort of the same thing, but typically this comes from a trust or a state at that time to a skip person. And then finally, a taxable like termination, that would be when a, a state or trust completely terminates and a distribution is made. The um, credit is applied, and if anything is above that, then you would, you would pay the tax on it, in addition to the normal estate tax. Under current law, if you're a U.S. resident, both you and your spouse, if you are, a, a, both are a, U.S. residents receive a double exemption amount you can use amongst yourselves. So you get to double it, which is great for planning. You also have an unlimited a deduction at death. So if you decide to 
give everything to your spouse upon death, you avoid the estate tax until the second spouse dies. You also have what's called portability to where if you have any unused exemption from the first spouse that dies, if you file the proper forms, you can harvest them both at the death of the last spouse and really maximize the ability to transfer wealth. The other thing that you need to be aware of is that any gifts during lifetime to a married spouse or the other spouse is gift tax free. So you can give as much money as you want and there's no tax applied at the transfer tax level. It's important to note and to find out from your clients their status in the United States. U.S. residents, green card holders, citizens, they are given these exemption amounts and they apply. And that's great. That's going to be the majority of the individuals that you uh, deal with. But if you have a non-resident alien, the rules are totally different and they can be a trap for the unwary. Mainly, the exemption amount for a non-resident alien is only $60,000. That's it. That's not a lot of money. We had a client here recently, husband and wife from the UK, that bought a home here in sunny Orlando and one of them died and they bought it in their own name. Well, instead of holding it in a way that it would avoid a death to where they apply the estate tax, they had US property in the United States upon their death. So the situs was here and the tax applied. Well, the home was $4 million. Well, half of the value went to, to the deceased spouse. She only received a $60,000 credit amount for the estate tax and they had to write a big check to the federal government. They were unhappy with that. So please be aware of that. There are ways to plan around this with the use of a qualified d domestic trust for a non-resident spouse during that spouse's lifetime where you, you can avoid the estate tax until that spouse dies, but that's something that's important and can be a trap for the un unwary. Okay, now from the perspective of the estate tax, there's a lot of things that you need to be aware of of how things are valued and if they are included or not in the amount. Also the mechanics of how it works. As a basic example, if you have utilized all of your credit amount during a lifetime through transfers to loved ones or whomever, anything that exceeds that credit is taxed at 40%. That can be during life or at death. There are some ways to play with that. We'll talk about that later and that you can lower or at least on paper by utilizing the tax code, take advantage of the things that are there to reduce the value of certain transfers so you're able to maximize the transfer of wealth. But namely, if the tax applies, you're paying 40 cents on the dollar. The flip side of that is if any asset is exposed to the federal estate tax, the donee, the person who receives the transfer, receives a step up in basis, which means that they receive the asset as if they bought it on that date of death at fair market value. That's important as it relates to the capital gains tax for the individual who receives the transfer. Conversely, if an individual receives a gift during lifetime, they the donee, the person who receives the gift, re receives a transferor basis. So their individual who had it before, whatever value or, or however they acquired it, that tax basis moves over to the person who receives the gift. And then at a later time, if they dispose of it through a sale, then that's how they would calculate the amount realized, which would equal any tax. So you have the amount realized, which is the purchase price, subtracted by the adjusted basis, which is however you acquired it, including depreciation equals um, any tax taxable gain or loss. So that's something you need to be aware of as well. Please remember that you can only acquire a basis in an asset by purchase, gift, or an inheritance, or if you earn it in, if you have it through income. That's basically it. There might be some exceptions to that, but that those are the main areas. You have to know the holding period of the asset for the individual who receives it so they can calculate 
big capital gain, either long-term or short-term. If it's more than a year and a day, it's long-term, tax at preferable rates, 15, 0, 15, or 20% under the current law. If it's a short-term, it's at their um, income tax rate, ordinary income tax rate, which can be right now 37% under current law. Okay. Now, who does it apply to? As I think we kind of discussed before, if you're a U.S. resident, it applies to your worldwide assets. That's for all transferred taxes, and it's based on the idea of domicile, your physical presence and intent to remain. It's different than income taxes. This is for the individual who it applies to when they die. You can be a, a state tax resident for, for U.S. taxes, but not for income and vice versa. So it's important that you understand that and that you tell your clients and find out so they can plan accordingly. Now, since it involves worldwide assets, it's important to understand that if they immigrate here or if they have, if they have inherited or bought anything overseas, all the assets and the entire value will be includable in their taxable gross estate. So there's a, there's a big calculation. There's a bunch of taxing codes that talk about it, have it here. You have property in which a uh, decedent had an interest. That's going to be pulled into their estate for evaluation. Join the interest either with a spouse or with a loved one or just a friend or whatever. You have life insurance. So if they own a policy on their own life, even though it might not pass through their probate estate, the value, unless it's in an islet, which we'll talk about later, that value is going to be pulled into their estate and tax, even though the estate might not have the money. You have retained life estates. If you think about like a life estate deed or something like that, or a ladybird. Um, you have transfers that, that take effect at death, maybe a pay on death asset. But again, the whole value is going to be includable in the decedent's estate. Their rev trust, they put things in the, in the name of the rev trust. The entire value is pulled back in. Uh, you have powers of appointment, things, for instance, that they may have an inheritance from another like loved one or friend. If they have the ability to appoint it at their death in their last will and testament or however it's allowed, and it's not limited to either you know, they're just they're like lineals or things in the other document, then the value of that ability to dispose of the asset, that value is pulled in. And then lastly, under 2035, if a person makes a gift and then within three years of that gift, they die, the tax code says that they pull that value back in. Now, if they paid any gift tax, they also get that credit amount back, but you get the appreciated value of the asset that's been pulled back in that is subjected to tax, and that can also be a bad thing. So once you, you find out what all these things are and you calculate the value and you go through, at that point, you have the gross estate. That gross estate is then in one column. You then take any unused credit, the unified credit, also known as the exemption. You would ex subtract that from the gross estate and then, and then we'll, whatever's left, that value, if it's positive, is going to be subjected to the estate tax at 40%. If it goes to a skip person, it will also be exposed to the GST tax at the same time. So the effective tax rate of going to a skip is going to be even higher than 40%. Now, all these assets are typically valued at the date of the, the decedent's death, so the date of death value. However, the tax code does allow for fluctuations and, and enables the executor of the estate or the trustee, usually be the executor doing the return to, to utilize what's called the alternative valuation date, which is six months to the date of death forward. You can look at both values and pick for the estate what is the most beneficial. Maybe things, they dropped in value, Maybe things went up, but you give the flexibility to the executor to make that choice at that time. In the Florida, that'd be the PR. 
but you know then be aware that that's out there and you should obviously wait until you have the ability at six months after death to make a choice how you want to on the 706 what valuation date that's going to be used that's the estate tax uh, tax form a gift tax form is form 709 now along with the the values the gross values and the exemption amounts before you have all that you also have certain deductions sort of like on an income tax return things that you're able to utilize to reduce the overall value of the estate this is important uh, the major one if, if you have a spouse is the unlimited marital deduction so anything that goes to the other spouse is not taxed at the time of the first spouse's death there are different ways to do that it can be a direct gift it can be through a trust a marital trust which you have to allow all the income to this surviving spouse and then at that spouse's death or whatever's left in the corpus would be taxed at that time you also have things like losses perhaps that were unharvested in life by the person that died any transfer to charity all of these things are important um, as we discussed before if you have a non-resident spouse who receives anything they you have to make sure that you know that you, you utilize a qualified domestic trust to hold that and you don't have any issues with that as relates to taxation until that that non-resident spouse dies So that's the estate tax, broad brushes. You, you, you know it's there, and that's probably, when people think of the death tax, that's really what it is. It's been around for a long time, and the idea is, is that for the privilege of making a transfer of wealth, even though it's already been taxed, uh, you have to pay a tax. And it goes back to England and the... Uh, feudal taxes and all. So, so to get around that, things like trusts were created to uh, minimize the tax. Things haven't changed. There's nothing new under the sun. There's also ways during lifetime to make an inter vivos or lifetime gift. And so to eliminate arbitrage, Congress decided to unify the amounts and the credits at the same time. That wasn't always the case, but that's how it is now. So with the gift tax, the, the, uh, Unified credit is the same, and it's based on a yearly basis, an annual basis. And the transfer is made, but the donor pays the tax, not, not the person who receives the actual gift, the donee. In the estate tax, you have the full estate, and the estate itself pays the estate tax off the top, and then whatever's left goes out to the beneficiaries. With the gift tax, it's different the donor pays the tax. So there's, so there's a way to actually give more money during life than at death because of the inclusive and ex exclusive nature of the tax by who's paying the tax and out of what uh, pot of money or, or, or value the tax is being paid. So if you, were, if you have cash and you decide that if you're the donor and you elect to make a gift during lifetime, and you give the full amount of the exemption in a year, and then you pay the tax out of your own pocket, the person who receives the gift is gonna have more value, more wealth has been transferred. That's great for cash, but if you give an appreciated asset, it's different, because even though you're able to give the fair market value out and you, when you value it for, for, the, for the actual tax, give taxes, the person who receives the donee will have a transfer basis so whatever i have so if i made a gift to my friend and i bought a house for let's say 10 million dollars and it's now worth 20 million dollars and i made a gift well when i make the gift the credit and the value of how it's calculated is the 20 million fair market value when i make the gift so i would pay gift tax on any value above my credit of 11.58 million assuming i haven't used used to any of it during my lifetime. My friend receives the gift. I pay the gift tax out of my own pocket, which is great for him, but when he sells that home, he's gonna pay capital gains on the appreciation at some point in time. He does it during his lifetime. 
if he dies and he owns it, then he'll get a step up in basis. But again, that asset will be exposed to his estate tax or the, the transfer taxes at his death. So there's a lot of calculation and thought that must go into when you counsel your clients the nature of the asset. There are some assets, especially cash, which are great to give during lifetime. There are others that you might want to hold until death because you want them to receive a step up in basis. So you have to play with the taxes and what makes the most sense. A short-term capital gain is at the ordinary income tax rate, which is 37% under current law. A long-term capital gain is either at zero, 15, or 20, depending on the tax bracket of the taxpayer who recognizes the tax or the gain at that time. So again, there's a lot of arithmetic that you have needs to, to go into this, and it's important to understand how the broad structure works. A lot of it's done now on the income tax side because the, the exemption amounts are so high now. So that kind of gives you an, an idea of broad strokes, how the gift tax, it differs some from the estate tax, but how at the end of the day, it's all about the transfer of wealth from one individual to another and the ability of the U.S. government to tax the value above a certain amount. Now, what constitutes a gift? If, if you're in the practice of estate planning, you hear all the time, what's a completed gift, what's incomplete? An incomplete gift is something that will be pulled back into the decedent's estate at their death. A completed gift means that the donor has relinquished all dominion and control over the asset so they can no longer pull it back or direct where it goes. And it's important because for the gift tax to apply, the, the transfer must be a completed gift. That doesn't happen. That asset, whatever it is, and how much appreciation takes place, it's at a point in time when the decedent dies or when they relinquish that control at that point, there's going to be a transfer where the transfer tax applies. Now, the give taxes... And the, and, and the rules we have, there are also some annual ex exclusion amounts and some other things that you're able to pay during, you're able to make gifts for the benefit of others during your lifetime and avoid the gift tax because these types of transfers are exempt. The main one is the annual exclusion amount under 2503B of $15,000 per individual. So no matter how many individuals you want to give to, if you have a wealthy client, they can make a $15,000 gift to anyone and not have to file a gift tax return and not owe any gift tax for the transfer. If spouses elect together to gift split, you can give up to $30,000 to any individual gift tax free in a given year. And that's per individual donee. Now, if you elect that, both of the spouses from then on have decided to split their gifts for all the gifts that they make in a given year. So it's good and bad. You can also pay things like health care, hospital bills, if the person who pays it directly to the hospital, tuition for school, if a parent pays it for a child, as long as the child, him or herself, is never touches the money, but the person who has the money pays it directly to the institution, then that is considered uh, an exemption under the gift tax rules and the gift tax will not apply. That's important because exp how expensive you know, college is now, that's one of the ways that a parent can do it. Just gonna make sure that they don't make a check out to the kid and the kid pays the tuition. It needs to go directly to the, the university. Now, we talked before about the unlimited give to spouses during their lifetime. You know, that's unlimited as long as they're a U.S. resident. Um, charitable gifts, the same thing applies. If you make a gift to charity, it's not a gift. I mean, it is, but it's not going to be something you pay you file a gift tax return for. Depending on the type of gift, you, you might get a income tax deduction. The same thing would happen if a trust gave a distribution to a charitable beneficiary. So we need to be aware of that. That's and then that's out there. That would include any private foundation, perhaps that the decedent made for his family. Sorry. And so overall, gifts are a great.
great way to utilize the credit amount, but a better than the estate tax, but it's important to know the type of asset that's being utilized. Does it make sense at that time to do it? And that we'll talk later about what types of trusts are vehicles to utilize these rules for both the gift and estate, and then in some instances, income taxes. Now, that's a overview of U.S. transfer taxes, which is the bulk of estate planning as relates to when you plan for your clients and how you want things to pass and to avoid having to pay the estate tax. And this is at both the federal level, which is what we're uh, talking about, but also at the, at the state level. A lot of states have an inheritance tax or an estate tax. At times, they're the same at the federal level and there are credits at other times and I know they're not especially uh, states in the Northeast and upper Midwest they have a lower exemption amount for the inheritance tax so we need to be aware of that as well but as for income taxes a trust is an entity so we tax it depending on the type of trust it is at a certain level either at the entity level the trust itself pays the taxes or at the beneficiary level, depending if the income in a given year is pushed out to the beneficiaries of the trust. All of this information and all these rules are found under subtitle J of, of the code. And that's in subtitle A, which is income taxes. Now, these taxes will be reported on a, a form 1041. So the so if you have an estate, the estate itself might have an income tax return um, with a 1041, and then you, a trust would have one too. There are some exemption amounts to where if it's if the income is below a certain threshold, you don't have to file. Sometimes it's good to file it anyway, so the statute runs for the fiduciary. But again, we'll talk about that. Also, there are the tax rates at the at the trust level are very much smaller and compressed. The marginal rate for a tr trust is like $13,000, and you're at the, you're at the 37 percent tax rate. For an individual, it's $600,000. Congress has made a determination that they want trust to push money out, and for the beneficiaries to pay the tax and not the trust. So the trust only accumulate income. The downside to that is if you push the income out, you don't have control of the assets, because once it's out in the beneficiary's hands, they're able to spend it however they want, it's exposed to their creditors and so on. So there's always a dichotomy at the planning level, how you want to structure these things. Do you want to have something which distributes all of the income in a given year, yearly? Or do you want to have a sprinkled trust that gives the trustee discretion to push out income in a given year or to accumulate it? And depending on what the trust document says and how it governs it, the income taxation of that asset or that entity, the trust, will be determined under those rules. Is it a simple trust, which means that, you know, I'll talk about the rules, is it dis distributed out all in one year, or is it a complex, which means that it has discretion to accumulate income in a given year? So first off, let's start with definitions. A simple trust is a trust that requires all of the income in a, in, a, in a given year, accounting income, to be distributed out. That has to be one. Two, you can't make any charitable distributions in a given year. Three, you can't make a distribution of corpus at all during the given year. If a trust fails any of those three so it's an and test one two and three if all three are met it's a simple trust if it fails any of those three it's considered a complex trust under the code and that's important because it'll govern the ta taxation of the income inside that trust the most common form of this would be a marital trust which requires all the income to be distributed in a given year as relates to the trust itself if it's a simple one, K-1s would be issued out, all the income is distributed out, the, the trust itself 
receives a complete deduction for all the the income in a given year. So there's no income tax due at the trust level. And then the beneficiary or beneficiaries would receive K-1s and then they would report the income on their income tax returns and that's over. That's how a simple trust works. Complex trusts are different. If the, in the discretion of the, the, the trustee, if all the income in a given year is distributed out, the rules would be the same as relates to taxation. There would be a deduction for everything that's distributed out. But if a complex trust distributes out corpus, it's different. Or if there are capital gains, which are recognized at the trust level, how those are allocated or governed by what's in the trust document or the Principal and Income Act of the state. So you need to be aware of that. And it's important too, there are different uh, deduction amounts of, of how it works. You know, in a state, it's a $600 a yearly exemption. A simple trust gets $300 and a complex trust gets $100. And they passed these laws back in 1954. They haven't changed them. So I guess that was a whole lot of money back then, but now it's not that much. But this does exist. If your trust has income below this threshold, there's no income that you have to report because you're below the exemption. So be aware of that. Now, we talked about the basics of taxation as relates to a simple and complex trust. It's important though that there's another type of tax that a complex trust, which a, a you know accumulates the income in a given year, doesn't distribute all out in a, in, a, in a given year and it puts it in a corpus over time. At some point, if that if income is just distributed out of the trust that exceeds the following year, the income in that given year. So let's say in 2018 there was a thousand dollars of income but the trust only distributed out $500 to the beneficiary. The following year, the trust had another $1,000 of income, but the trust distributed out $1,500 to the beneficiary. The rules state that the first 1,000 in 2020 is like any other income in a given year. You push that out and the beneficiary pays the tax on that. The $500 of accumulated income, there's a special tax, the accumulation tax under IRC 666 and 667. This, it's a arithmetic and it's an average of what was held before. It's like a five-year average. You do the calculation and then whatever it is, after you do that, you pay an additional tax. So that, that's a trap for the unwary. It's there. You need to be aware of it. And it's important to understand that. Now, now we have some stuff here that are some, some important vehicles that are under the current tax code that allow you to take advantage of a lot of the rules that we've just discussed, the, the overview of taxation. The most common one that we know for sure works and is effective because it's in the code is a Qualified Personal Residence Trust, or QPERT for short. This is a irrevocable trust, which means that it's a completed gift. It's out of your estate. You, the person who owns the property makes the, the transfer of the, of the real estate. Now, it can be a, your primary residence or a vacation home. You can do up to two in your lifetime. It's okay. It has to be one or the other. As long as it, it meets that criteria of the residence, the idea being that you give this value, this amount, this property into this trust, but you as the donor retain an interest to use the property for a given time. So by, by doing that, you reduce the value of the gift because you, even though you made a complete a gift, you retain the ability to use it during the term. Whatever the term is, it can be five years, 10 years, doesn't matter. Obviously, the longer the term is, then the smaller the overall gift that, that you've made. Now, the downside, though, is, is that if you pick a term 
that is longer than your lifespan, <laughs> then it collapses and it pulls the value, the entire value of the property back in. Why? Because as we discussed before, you have retained an interest in a trust. So you have to decide the, at the planning level, depending on the age of the person, their health, the longer the term, the smaller the gift, but the larger risk that it can be pulled back in. So that's, but that's, that's it, but it's a great way to uh, utilize this and then anything after that. So once the term ends and then it's, the, it's completed, everything's out, the term's over, the person who made the gift no longer has the ability to utilize the home unless they pay fair market rent, which they're able to do. That's another way to get money out of their estate. They're paying the fair market value of rent to live there. All the money goes into the trust. That's not theirs anymore. It's not a gift because it's, it's for value, the fair market value, and then the trust itself would have income, but it's a, another way to reduce the overall size of the estate of the person who made the gift. So great way, great thing to do. If you're not, if you're not uh, utilizing this, I recommend it. On the other side, if, if you're the beneficiary of this trust, because of the gift, the trust would receive a transfer or basis, which means that whatever the adjusted basis was when the person who made the gift, whatever they bought it for, or however they acquired it, that value would go on into the trust. And then when it's distributed out or sold, that would be the basis for de determining any capital gain at some point in time when it's sold. So again, you don't get a step up at death but you do, you're able to get the, the value out. You freeze the value at it and you reduce the gift tax in this transaction. So, it, so it's a great thing. The other type of trust that's, that's important, that's easy to use is a charitable lead trust. Now this is more for, you get an income tax deduction, which is really why you would utilize this. And a lot of times if, if you run the math, you can actually end up with more net money at the end of this. But basically you create an irrevocable trust in which the person who creates it sets a fixed annual gift for a charity. So during the time the charity receives an income stream or you know an annuity and then at a point in time, once it's over, then it reverts back to the grantor. So if it highly appreciates, that could be a really good deal for the person who does this. And in the meantime, they get an income tax deduction during the time of the term. So it's a great way to have charitable intent, to uh, utilize this thing that's here and receive an income tax deduction for your other income in a given year, but then still get the asset back in the end. So we find that it's very useful. And if you have a lot of, if you have clients that have a high amount of income, in a given year, it's a way to reduce that taxable income and have a charitable intent. So that's that's a lead trust or a, a clap. Um, the other on the backside, at the inverse of that, is a remainder trust. And here, the idea is is that you create an irrevocable trust with the idea that you, the grantor, retains an income back from the trust during a a term of years. And then once that term is over, the, the remainder goes to the charity. So again, it's another way to receive an income tax because they're able to value it based on the term and all those things. And then the person who makes the gift gets an income tax deduction during that entire time. And then when it's over, you're getting income back during that time. But then when it's over, the charity has the, the uh, remainder. So these are two income tax ways to, to have charitable intent, but receive a great income tax deduction. The next one that's here, the a grantor retained annuity trust is a great way if you want a, a, a state freeze. The idea being that you have a business or you have some asset or something that you know is going to really appreciate in value and the grantor knows that the longer they hold it, the higher the value is going to go. So since you're capped at 11.58 million for a lifetime as your exemption amount, 
the idea is, is that you can freeze the value of what the asset is right now. And then depending on what it is, if you utilize an LLC or an FLP, you can actually make minority transfers of the asset and get a huge valuation discount with, with the transfer into the annuity. So you reduce the overall um, exposure to the, the U.S. transfer tax. The idea being that the asset inside the GRAT would appreciate at a large amount more than the annuity that you that you retain over a course of years. So you would have a term. You would give, you know, you would have maybe a five-year term, and then you know, and then based on that, there would be an annuity paid back to the person who made the gift. And depending on how large that annuity is, you can actually almost zero out the gift entirely. But anything that it sees that valuation is outside of the person's estate forever. So there are a lot of games that can be played with that. You, you can either do a lot of it now and pay some estate and gift tax now, or you can zero it out. But the idea being that the growth inside of the GRAT will exceed the annuity back. And you just don't want to die like we have with the Cupert. If you die during the term of the annuity, it would pull the assets back in. So it's always a game of, you know, are you going to outlive the term? And then obviously the longer it is, the smaller the annuity back will be and the more value you're able to get out. So there's a lot of things here you, that you're able to do with the math, but it's a great vehicle, especially if there's a business involved or it's, you know, if it's real estate or even securities here recently in the last four or five years, this the stock box, the stock market's been gangbusters. And so the more you can get stuff out and you receive that annuity back, anything that exceeds the value is going to be outside of the estate. And potentially there's no estate tax or gift tax uh, credit amount that's even utilized. So that's something that you should definitely use. And if you're worried about timing and death and if they're in bad health, you can also utilize what are called ladder grats. The idea being that instead of putting all the assets in one, you can do one that's last a year, one that lasts five years, one that lasts 10 years. The idea being that every time the annuity is paid back and the term is over, once it's over, that, that asset, the appreciated asset that's inside is outside the person's estate forever. And if they die, the entire amount's not pulled back in because you've laddered it. It's tiered. So that's, that's one of the ways that you're able to really uh, utilize this. The next main one that is should be utilized all the time is an irrevocable life insurance trust or ILIT for short. ILITs ought to be very common if your client has an income, sorry, if, you're, if your client has a life insurance policy and as we discussed before, if they own it when they die, even though this asset's not in their probate estate when they die because it's designated, it pays out on death to whomever they name, that value, though, is pulled back in, and it's used to value their estate tax, to determine their estate tax, the value of the gross estate, and if it exceeds the amount, they pay tax on it. So one way to avoid this is that if you create an islet, either you would transfer the policy that you, you currently have, or hopefully you would create it, and then the, the, uh, the islet itself would buy the policy, that being that you would avoid the three-year gift rule, as we discussed before. If you die within 30 years of the gift, it pull it back in. If the if the um, if the islet itself buys the policy, you don't have that problem. You might have some seed money, the gift that you made in there, but that 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 would be it. But this islet, when you die, when the death benefit explodes, if it's in an islet and it's you know depending on how you structure, it's done the right way the entire value of the life insurance policy is not part of the person's deceased person's estate, which can be substantial. Policies can be three, four, five, ten, ten million dollars. And it's it's complete liquidity to the, the beneficiaries of the that trust. So it's a great way to really leverage wealth, get it out of the estate, and if you need the money, you've got cash at death. You should, if you have a high net worth client that has life insurance, they shouldn't own it because that that value, you know, is going to be part of their estate. Now, there are ways to plan. You might need to have it to pay the estate tax and they're going to have an estate tax issue. That's different. But 
you should you, you should really like utilize this and, and really ask your clients if they have anything, especially for term policies, it's the best for a very small amount. And even over time, the person who makes who who creates the islet and the policy is going to be on their life, they can make annual gifts with the exclusion amount fifteen thousand per individual, which is based on the beneficiaries of the trust. You can count them up and make a fifteen thousand dollar gift each year and not pay the gift tax. So you can actually make gifts to this trust to pay the premiums inside of it. Now, the caveat to that is you have to do a crummy letter each year, which the, the trustee of the trust has to write a, a letter to all the beneficiaries of the trust who the donor has made a gift to that gives them a withdrawal right, 30-day withdrawal right. If, if you give notice and the 30-day lapses and at that point it qualifies for a present gift and you can use the exclusion amount if you don't give a crummy letter then it's a gift so that's something that the, the trustees need to be aware of and it's, and, it's, and it's a great way like i said to get things outside of the estate and then lastly one that's utilized a lot at a high net worth level is an intentionally defective granted trust. Now, what is that? What does that mean? Well, there was a concern a long time ago that the very wealthy were utilizing trust as a way to avoid income tax at their high income tax brackets. In the old days, you know, uh, the uh, brackets were like at 90% at one time. They were very, very high. And so the idea was you would create a, a, a trust and the trust would pay income tax at a low rate and so congress said that's not really fair so they passed these rules to to try to avoid that but what they ended up doing is they put loopholes in the code to where a very wealthy individual could make a could make a completed gift for estate tax purposes and gift taxes so you get it out of your estate but you can then pay the income tax on the income inside the trust if there are certain powers are retained inside the trust so it's a grantor trust, the idea that the grantor pays the income taxes, but for estate tax purposes, it's outside of the estate. So there's a way to really like leverage this with this idea that you intentionally make the trust defective where it is a grantor trust and the grantor pays the income tax on the income. Now, why is this important? Well, by, by using this, you, the, the person who makes the trust and creates it, then they can put some seed money in there. Let's say 10% of the value of a business, especially. Then the trust can then buy the business from the grantor, freeze the value of what is valued today and give a note in return. Well, a grantor trust the grantor and the trust itself are considered the same for income taxes. So there's no sale. There's no gain there, which is great. But in the meantime, they can pay interest on the note, but they, they can get the value out at a freeze value. A, a, a lot of times at a discounted value, depending on how much is sold, there's a way to get a lot of value out and really maximize the income tax rules. But when the person, when the grantor dies, whatever's inside that trust, whatever it is, is not includable in their estate because they've made a completed gift and it's outside, it's gone. So you definitely should be thinking about this and explain to your clients that these are a way to really uh, utilize these tax strategies, these vehicles to take advantage of the rules, both at the gift, estate, and income tax levels. Lastly, it's important that if you have a client that is a non-resident alien and they're outside the United States, they create things before they come here, maybe some you know, pre-immigration things, the idea being that they want to get all of their assets outside of the U.S. transfer tax a net before they immigrate him here and they get their green card, which is great. I mean, that's, that's the way you should definitely do it. You should plan. 
because once they get their green card, all their worldwide assets are exposed to our tax basis. Now, they would get the credits, but if you have a lot of, if he exceeds that, there are ways to plan to avoid that. Well, one of the issues is, is when they come in and then they're, they're a U.S. person, but they have a foreign trust offshore that they created within five years of coming here. And there are some income tax impl implications to that under um, IRC 684, the deemed sale rule. Um, now, you know, it's kind of complicated, but you need to be aware of that. And that's another way that you can plan at times to utilize planning, be it from the income tax side. For estate taxes, it's out. If, you, if they make a gift that's in the NRA and they're offshore, it's gone because the, the U.S. has no jurisdiction over a foreign asset that, that is transferred by a non-resident alien. However, inside the United States, that's different. If the situs is here, if the property, it will be something, especially, especially if it's real estate, there's going to be a gift tax applied for that. You only get a $60,000 exemption amount. You need to be aware of the way that you can get around that is if you own it by a foreign corporation, then it's outside and it's a foreign aid entity that's the way you should plan but again be aware that if people come in or if they expatriate or, the, or they leave or if they have a domestic trust and you know the trustee either resigns or dies and then then the new trustee is a foreign resident there are some things that can occur on the income tax side you need to be aware of under 684 and then 679 their income taxes but again there are ways from planning to really take advantage of these things from the non-resident alien perspective there are some exemptions to the estate tax um, one of which is uh, the gift of intangibles they, they can do it and it's gift tax free they just don't want to own it when they die here because then it's a US you know asset and they only have $60,000 exemption amount now we have gone through a broad amount of material here as relates to tax reduction with trust, how they're utilized, and ways in which they ought to be utilized. It's important to make sure that you have all the facts of the clients, where things are owned, who owns them, how they're titled, because there are a lot of pitfalls as relates to how things are done and how they're titled because if they're titled in the wrong way or they're they're structured in a way to where they're pulled back in you really don't get any of the advantages of these things of these vehicles that exist for individuals to really take advantage of our tax rules because there's a lot of things here that a lot of times people are unaware of they don't plan and they have no idea that they even exist so it's your responsibility as an attorney in this area to number one acquire all the information understand how things are owned where they're located and then a plan accordingly depending on the nature of the asset you know when i first started their practice it was all about trying to equalize who owns what you know the spouses especially we had A and B trusts, and the idea is that, you know, if you died and you didn't utilize your exemption amount, your unified credit amount, it was lost forever. They changed in 2011 with the idea of portability, which is great. So that kind of changes the analysis and the calculus with when we plan. But when that does happen, you still have to file a portability return. You still have to understand, you know, and follow the rules so you can utilize that later. It's important. The other thing is, is that a lot of times you don't find out all the information and depending on the nature of the asset, if you have a trust, even if it's a domestic trust, if the trust owns foreign assets, be it bank accounts, investments, like real estate, you know, other parts of the world, it's very common now. There are a lot of compliance requirements that the trust will have to be aware of and actually use. You know, you've got FATCA, um, you've got FBARs, you know, any account over $10,000.
there are a lot of positives to these things and the, the ability to structure things to where they, that, they, that they actually work and minimize the wealth taxation. But there are a lot of pitfalls on the other side as well that if you're unaware of these rules exist on the compliance side, that it can look really bad and your malpractice and insurer is really gonna be involved in it. That being said, if any of you have any questions regarding any of the things that I discussed today, please feel free to contact me or the administrator here at Law CLE. We're happy to respond to any of your questions and thank you very much. These vehicles to take advantage of the rules, both at the gift estate and income tax levels. Lastly, it's important that if you have a client that is a non-resident alien and they're outside the United States, they create things before they come here, maybe some you know pre-immigration things, the idea being that they want to get all of their assets outside of the U.S. and transfer tax a net before they immigrate him here and they get their green card, which is great. I mean, that's that's the way you should definitely do it. You should plan because once they get their green card, all their worldwide assets are exposed to our tax basis. Now, they would get the credits, but if you have a lot of – if he exceeds that, there are ways to plan to avoid that. Well, one of the issues is, is when they can come in – and then they're, they're a U.S. person, but they have a foreign trust offshore that they created within five years of coming here. And there are some income tax impl implications to that under um, IRC 684, the deemed sale rule. Um, now, you know, it's kind of complicated, but you need to be aware of that. And that's another way that you can plan at times to utilize planning be it from the income tax side. For estate taxes, it's out. If you if they make a gift that's in the NRA and they're offshore, it's gone. Because the, the U.S. has no jurisdiction over a foreign asset that, that is transferred by a non-resident alien. However, inside the United States, that's different. If the situs is here, if the property, it will be something, such, especially if it's real estate, there's going to be a gift tax applied for that. You only get a $60,000 exemption amount. You need to be aware of the way that you can get around that is if you own it by a foreign corporation, then it's outside and it's a foreign entity. That's the way you should plan. But again, be aware that if people come in or if they expatriate or, the, or they leave or if they have a domestic trust and, you know, the trustee either resigns or dies and then, then the new trustee is a foreign resident. There are some things that can occur on the income tax side you need to be aware of under 684 and then 679, their income taxes. But again, there are ways from planning to really take advantage of these things. From the non-resident alien perspective, there are some exemptions to the estate tax, um, one of which is uh, the gift of intangibles. They, they can do it and it's gift tax free. They just don't want to own it when they die here because then it's a U.S. you know asset and they only have $60,000 exemption amount. Now, we have gone through a broad amount of material here as relates to tax reduction with trust, how they're utilized, and ways in which they ought to be utilized. It's important to make sure that you have all the facts of the clients, where things are owned, who owns them, how they're titled, because there are a lot of pitfalls as relates to how things are done and how they're titled, because if they're titled in the wrong way or they're, they're structured in a way to where they're pulled back in, you really don't get any of the advantages of these things, of these vehicles that exist for individuals to really take advantage of our tax rules because there's a lot of things here that a lot of times people are unaware of they don't plan 
and they have no idea that they even exist. So it's your responsibility as an attorney in this area to, number one, acquire all the information, understand how things are owned, where they're located, and then a plan accordingly depending on the nature of the asset. You know, when I first started in practice, it was all about trying to equalize who owns what, you know, the spouses especially. We had A and B trusts, and the idea is that, you know, if you died and you didn't utilize your exemption amount, your unified credit amount, it was lost forever. They changed in 2011 with the idea of portability, which is great. So that kind of changes the analysis and the calculus with when we plan. But when that does happen, you still have to file a portability return. You still have to understand, you know, and follow the rules so you can utilize that later. It's important. The other thing is, is that a lot of times you don't find out all the information. And depending on the nature of the asset, if you have a trust, even if it's a domestic trust, if the trust owns foreign assets, be it bank accounts, investments, like real estate, you know, other parts of the world, it's very common now, there are a lot of compliance requirements that the trust will have to be aware of and actually use. You know, you've got FATCA, um, you've got FBARs, you know, any account over $10,000. There are a lot of positives to these things and the, the ability to structure things to where they that they that they actually work and minimize the wealth taxation. But there are a lot of pitfalls on the other side as well, that if you're unaware of these rules exist on the compliance side, that it can look really bad and your malpractice and insurer is really going to be involved in it. That being said, if any of you have any questions regarding any of the things that I discussed today, please feel free to contact me or the administrator here at Law CLE. We're happy to respond to any of your questions, and thank you very much.